Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're going through the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 19 today. We're going to just look at something briefly in chapter, Joshua chapter 19, verse 49. So you can turn your Bible there for a minute or so. Do want to remind you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Study all of the Bible with me right there using my audio Bible mass messages. Just choose, click, and listen from four complete series going through the whole Bible, going back over 36 years to the very beginning of Scripture Verse by Verse. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in these chapters, um, they lay out which tribes and which parts of the tribes were given certain parts of their part of the promised land. It lays it all out in detail. So obviously I'm not going to spend time looking at all that stuff. But there is something that is interesting. And I want to read verses 49 and 50 in Joshua 19. Because it says, When they had made an end of dividing the land for inheritance by their coast, the children of Israel gave an inheritance to Joshua, the son of Nun, among them. So all the tribes and all the families had received their portion of the promised land. Now it's time to give Joshua, the leader, his part. But, and notice what it says, verse 50. According to the word of the Lord, they gave him the city which he asked, even Timnath, Sirah, in Mount Ephraim. And he built the city and dwelled therein. So after everyone else received their portion of the land, Joshua, the faithful leader, God said, God his. And just as God instructed, Joshua was allowed to choose whatever place he wanted. So he had the whole promised land to choose from, or at least the, the part in his tribe. He could choose any part that he wanted. So he asked for and received Timnath. Timnath, probably the absolute worst part of the entire promised land, which really tells you something about Joshua and his attitude. If you haven't appreciated Joshua up until this point, which I find hard to believe, you sure should appreciate him now, especially when you look at some of these high-profile preachers in the kind of places that they are living in with the money from the offerings that well-meaning Christians in many cases send into them. They're living pretty high. Joshua could have chosen any place to live. He chose the worst city, the worst area in the entire promised land. You know, as long as he had God and was getting by with his needs met, Joshua was satisfied. He didn't need fancy. He didn't need pretty. He didn't need anything special. Now, fancy is okay. It's not sinful. Fancy is okay. Not fancy is okay too, though. The important thing is to be right with God and find your contentment in God and your relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Because if you have that, then if you have something fancy, that'll be fine. You'll be thanking God for it. If you don't have it, it's no big deal. Because it's not the most important thing. You got the most important thing. And that's your relationship with Almighty God through Jesus Christ. Now, chapters 20 and 21 record the distribution 
distribution of the Holy Land among the tribes of Israel. So let's go all the way down to chapter 22. Chapter 22 of the book of Joshua. Verse 1. Then Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And remember, those two and a half tribes are the ones who received their portion of land outside the mainland, east of the Jordan River. They received their portion, but before they could really settle down in it, they had to cross the border into the promised land proper and help their relatives conquer the Canaanites. That's been done. The land is distributed. Now they can go home to the land that they were promised on the east side of the Jordan River. Verse 2, And said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. So Joshua calls for a meeting, and in this meeting he encourages and commends the two and a half tribes for the good that they did. They kept the word of the Lord. They kept their end of the deal. And Joshua commends them. It is important to commend people when they do something right. People need encouragement. And, and notice what it says in verse 3. You have not left your brethren these many days to this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. They did not abandon their fellow Israelites. They had been faithful, even though it had not been easy. They were away from their homes. They were away from their families, their children, their wives, for seven years. That's a long time because their families stayed back in the land that was going to be theirs. But the, all the men came and fought, so they were gone for seven years. Verse 4, And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brethren, as he promised them. Therefore now return you and get you to your tents and to the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you, on the other side of the Jordan. God keeps his promises. God is the only true promise keepers. I don't even know if that group is still around. Remember that? Maybe about 10 years ago. Of course, I used to listen to Christian radio. I don't listen to it anymore because I don't find it to be very Christian. Watered down mush for sermons. Psycho, psycho babble. A lot different than when I first got saved when there were so many Bible teaching programs. That's all there was. Anyway, one of the things that became a, a big fad among modern evangelicals was promise keepers. And all the men would come and to these big rallies along with Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses and any other kind of cult that you can possibly imagine. They all came and joined Dan's. And nobody talked about, nobody talked about doctrine. Uh, you just forget it. You know, it doesn't matter if the person next to you was going to hell. You don't want to talk about that because you don't want to offend them. We, get, we all got to make these promises to our wives and children or whoever. Promise keepers, it was called. Well, they were all promise breakers because that's what people do. We're not even supposed to make promises. We're not even supposed to make oaths. We're supposed to let our yes be yes and our no be no. Because God Almighty is the only true promise keeper. And he sure kept his promise here. The rest of us, well, we are all promise breakers. Sometimes by our own fault. Sometimes it's not the fault of our own. It's circumstances. But you can't, that's why God says, don't swear. You're not sovereign. It's evil. It is evil to make a promise. It's evil to swear an oath, which is the same thing. Because you're not sovereign. You don't know if you'll be able to keep it or not. You don't even know if you're going to be around tomorrow. But 
they had been faithful. They were promise keepers as far as promising to or saying they would help the brethren before they would return to their homes. They had been away from their homes and their families for 70 years, and God has kept his promise, not just to them, but to all the people of Israel. If you and I, just to illustrate the difference, if you and I have ever failed, even one single time, to do what we said we'd do, and we're not a promise keeper, we're a promise breaker. And that's one thing more that sets us apart from Almighty God, because that never happens with him. But that is why making an unconditional promise is forbidden by God. It is sinful pride that causes someone to make an unconditional promise. We're living in a world that we cannot control. Therefore, we should not make unconditional promises. So anyway, verse 5. But take diligent heed to the commandment and the law, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you, to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cling to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all of your soul. So Joshua's final message to those two and a half tribes before they cross the the Jordan River and go home. His final message to them was not work hard. His final message was not be kind, don't cheat. It wasn't any of those things. He didn't say get enough sleep, brush your teeth after every meal. His final message to them was put God first. Because you know what? If they put God first, then everything else is going to fall into place the way it should. Staying in God's moral will is not that difficult. Put God first. If you put God first, that's the important thing. That's what you can control. And then you can trust that you will be walking in the will of God. Everything else will fall into place. All the details. Verse 6. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away. And they went to their tents. Now to the one half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given possessions in Bashan. But the other half thereof gave Joshua among their brethren on this side of Jordan westward. And when Joshua sent them away also to their tents, then he blessed them and he spoke to them saying, Return with much riches to your tents and with very much cattle, with silver and with gold and with brass and with iron, and with very much raiment. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brethren. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel out of out from Shiloh, or out of Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to the country of Gilead, to the land of their possession, whereof they were possessed according to to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. So the two and a half tribes got permission to live on the east side of the Jordan River, but it really wasn't God's best for them. They were a long way and across the river, which was kind of a big deal back in those days, you know. They were a long way from the central place of worship in Jerusalem. And because they were outside the borders of the Holy Land, they were also more susceptible to enemy attack. But that's what they wanted. It wasn't God's best, but he allowed it. Now, they're going to do something next time. Before they cross the Jordan, you can't miss this next broadcast. This is going to be good. This is really going to be interesting, and we're going to have a lot of lessons to draw from this. So make sure you join me next time here on Scripture Verse by Verse. We'll pick it up in verse 10. In the meantime, of course, you can study all of God's Word with me at thebibleversebyverse.com as much as you want, any time that you want, any part of the Bible that you want. Again, at the Scripture Verse by Verse website found at thebibleversebyverse.com. 
And if you would like to be a part of Scripture verse by verse, you can be by praying for me and God's Word, because the moment you do that, you become a part of Scripture verse by verse, and I appreciate your prayers so very much. And also, when you take a break from studying with me, go to the front page, click the donate button, and prayerfully give us a Lord may lead, because that also makes you a part of this ministry. So with that, until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.